Hi there, everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. I'd like to begin by thanking Homeless Network Scotland for inviting me to speak today. It's a really massive privilege to be joined by so many passionate advocates for ending homelessness, even if we're sadly unable to meet up in person. A year ago, this conference took place in the midst of one of the hardest periods of the pandemic. With case numbers rising and hospitals under more and more pressure, the UK was experiencing a huge spike in COVID cases. We didn't know it at the time, but that growth in coronavirus cases would soon mean the return of lockdown during winter. One of the themes from last year's conference was same storm, different boats. A metaphor aimed at reminding us that while we were all navigating one of the most challenging periods of our lives, not everyone has had the same experience. We are all in the same storm, but in very different boats, while some people have no boat at all. With that in mind, I want to begin by paying tribute to our partners across the homelessness sector and beyond for the work they did during the most difficult of circumstances. In March 2020, as COVID began to spread across the UK, our immediate priority as a homelessness charity and across our sector was to make sure that people were supported to get off the streets and into safe, self-contained accommodation. The decision to move people from the streets and to give them a roof over their heads undoubtedly saved lives. Initially, it protected people from the threat of the um, pandemic, but then as winter arrived, it protected them from the cold as temperatures in Scotland fell to some of the lowest in years. It's hard to understate the scale of that achievement. Organisations like the Simon A. A Community Scotland and Streetwork utilise decades of their own expertise to radically reduce the number of people forced into sleeping on our streets and then to keep those numbers low as the pandemic it continued. Whereas data and raw sleeping figures before March 2020 suggest that over 1,500 people were sleeping out the night before they accessed help, during the pandemic we heard that in many areas the numbers of people forced into sleeping rough fell to extremely low levels. It was a decision which fundamentally changed the nature of homelessness in Scotland. Something previously considered impossible, essentially ending the injustice of rough sleeping, was achieved in a matter of days. It saved lives, but it also showed us what we can do whenever we work together with expert advice backed by strong political will. But that response had consequences. People experiencing homelessness were given the support they desperately required, but the result was that a record number of people were left stuck in accommodation like B&Bs and hotels. Already a long-standing problem in Scotland, even before the pandemic, the last year saw so the number of households living in temporary accommodation go from 11,600 before the pandemic to reaching just over 14,000. Official statistics released earlier this year show that the average time spent in temporary accommodation also increased, rising from an average of 187 days last year up to 199 days in 2020. 21. Meanwhile, 900 families have been waiting for at least two years to get a place called home. That means that while the number of people rough sleeping may be down, Poverty, inadequate welfare support, a lack of joined up services and a shortage of affordable housing means the number of people currently homeless and less stuck in temporary accommodation remains far too high. The theme for this year's conference is choice. No choice without options, no options without choice. But the people currently stuck in temporary accommodation, left unable to move on with their lives, have been left with very little in the way of choice. These are people, families with children, stuck in limbo, provided with a bed and a roof, but left unable to move on with their lives, in some cases for long periods of time. And some are left without access to proper cooking or laundry facilities. We know how that experience impacts on someone's personal relationships and how damaging it can be for their mental health. People find themselves cut off from friends and their family stuck for long periods of time with a roof over their head but without a real home and are often forced to watch as their relationships deteriorate around them. People can feel unsafe, they can start to feel more and more depressed 
and they can be stuck in a sense of uncertainty about their own future. And this is the problem which we need to address. Scotland has some of the best protections in the world for people who lose their home, but with 8% of Scots having experienced homelessness, or around 1 in 12 people, it's clear far too many people are forced to go through the homelessness system in the first place. It's clear that we need to focus on preventing homelessness from happening. Ending homelessness does not mean that nobody will ever lose their home again. It means that through prevention, homelessness only happens very rarely, that when it does happen, it is brief, and that once it has happened to an individual or family, it's prevented from happening again. And with the publication of the Prevention Review Group report back in February, we finally in Scotland have a working blueprint for what an effective system of prevention could look like. The road here has been a long one. After all, prevention is not a new concept in Scottish public policy. The Christie A Commission report, which saw its 10 year anniversary this year, stressed these very same points. Prevention was one of the four P's identified in Campbell Christie's report alongside people, partnership and performance. Almost a decade later, in November 2019, the Scottish Government asked Crisis to convene an independent group of cross-sector experts to take forward the Scottish Government commitment to introduce a new homelessness prevention duty on local authority and public bodies. The focus was on developing specific legal recommendations to enhance and strengthen targeted crisis and recovery prevention. The Prevention Review Group, made up of experts from local government, the homelessness sector and academia, and chaired by Professor Suzanne Fitzpatrick, produced recommendations on how best to do this. In doing it, it was supported by the Prevention Commission, a group of people with lived and frontline experience of homelessness, whose views helped to shape their proposals. In fact, the Commission proved fundamentally important to the group's recommendations, using their own unique and valuable insight to ensure that the group didn't just address people's lived experience, but that it was very much shaped by it. I want to quote one of the Prevention Commission members, Lisa Punton, whose quote was included in the forward of the Prevention Review Group report. Lisa said, and I quote, over the years, I have become increasingly frustrated with the, with the existing legislative framework. In providing such a strong safety net for people experiencing homelessness, something of what we were trying to achieve, which is to prevent homelessness, was lost. Similarly, the policy recognition that homelessness is often the failing of all services and public policies and the role of other public bodies in preventing it is long overdue. Having lived experience in this process was crucial. Whilst we often think we know how good our systems and processes are, those who have experienced them can tell us how they truly impact on their lives amid crisis and trauma. For me, this was powerful. It challenged my thinking in some areas, but also affirmed it in others, which was reassuring as a service provider. If we really want to end homelessness, those with a lived experience must always have a seat at the table. End quote. <laughs> I would like to take a moment to thank Lisa and the other members of the Prevention Commission for their time and their insight in helping to put together the Prevention Commission's report and that of the Prevention Review Group. They provided a powerful sounding board on what does and does not work while sharing their own expertise on how to build a system that puts people at its centre. And the central message coming from the Prevention Commission was clear, that choice must be at the centre of the new system. No choice without options, no options without choice. The Commission also stressed the importance of including a duty to ask in the plans to prevent homelessness. By this, we mean start by asking people first, what needs to happen to prevent you from becoming homeless? This duty to ask could be in two different parts, with a duty on wider partners, for example, in the NHS, our partners in the justice system, to routinely ask about someone's housing situation. The answers people provide to this question will then form the basis of a duty to act in line with people's understanding of their own circumstances, their choices and their preferences. You ask if someone needs help, then act on that answer. It might sound simple, but it has long been a missing piece in the prevention agenda. This approach, 
Summing from the voices of those in lived experience is people-led and strengths-based. Two important principles in effective, flexible homelessness prevention. Beyond the importance of choice, the Prevention Review Group report recommended the following. Firstly, that action to prevent homelessness should start up to six months before someone faces losing their home. Secondly, as I just outlined, that public bodies, just health services, should ask about people's housing situation to identify any issues at an early stage and act where that problem exists. Thirdly, that public bodies should work together with housing professionals to ensure that people get help early and do not lose their home unnecessarily. The proposals have implemented would ensure that no one leaves an institution such as a hospital or, for example, a prison without somewhere to sleep that night. And clarifying the current law and requiring local authorities to take specific steps to prevent homelessness, building on recent developments in England and in Wales. This would mean that once again, Scotland has the strongest protections across the three nations for people facing the prospect of homelessness. The recommendations would mean that people facing homelessness have greater choice and control in where they live and have access to the same options as other members of the public. They set out protections which must be in place to ensure that an individual's housing is stable and meets their needs, minimising their future risk of homelessness. So why do it like this? Well, in short, because a change in the law is needed to clarify the place of homelessness prevention in the current statutory homelessness framework so that prevention is not perceived as gatekeeping and so that the law can move into line with best practice. By acting earlier and offering support before someone hits a point of emergency, we can reduce the number of people who become homeless needlessly. Acting earlier would reduce the use of temporary accommodation, stopping more and more families from having to go through the system. It would save people from the trauma and indignity of homelessness, and it would also save huge amounts of public money, which we could better spend elsewhere. In fact, even before you consider the damage that long times in temporary accommodation can do to people's lives, the current system is also incredibly expensive. We have high rates of homelessness applications in Scotland, and that means we have very high use of temporary accommodation. Numbers have consistently sat at around 11,000 households at any one time. And as everyone here knows, recent years have seen that number go even higher. In 2013, Audit Scotland estimated that it cost councils 75% more to accommodate people in temporary accommodation than it would have done to house them in a permanent home. Meanwhile, figures obtained from a Freedom of Information request in 2018 put the bill for temporary accommodation at £660 million over five years. £660 million. That is a staggering amount of money, even before you begin to think about the cost to other public services caused by our failure to offer help earlier, particularly in health services like A&E and mental health support. So we know, we know that in Scotland, we need to do more to prevent homelessness. Current prevention duties can be unclear, but under the recommendations of the Prevention Review Group, we can create concrete, enforceable protections for people while helping to drive a change in culture. Scotland rightly has a reputation for having strong rights for people who, are, who become homeless, but rights for people who are threatened with homelessness are less clear cut. This means at the moment, it is often difficult for local authorities to know where their responsibility to prevent homelessness starts and ends. And while Scotland has strong rights in place of people who lose their home, the last few years have seen Scotland fall behind England and Wales when it comes to prevention. In both countries, legislation has been created through the Homelessness Reduction Act to help prevent people experiencing homelessness. England and Wales have both seen drops in the, full, um, in the rate of full homelessness acceptances in the couple of years since they introduced new prevention legislation. At the same time, Scotland has experienced a slight rise in the rate of people making homelessness applications. To the Scottish Government, that means that in its current form, the impact of housing options work is unlikely to lead to further large reductions in applications beyond those already seen. Or in other words, if we want to end homelessness in Scotland, we need to prevent it. And thanks to the Prevention Review Group's report and the Prevention Commission, we know how to do just that. 
The group's final recommendations were published in February this year and were divided into two different parts. The first set of recommendations focus on introducing a range of legal duties in public bodies. These, for example, include a new duty on health and social care partnerships to cooperate with the local authority to plan for the needs of applicants for homelessness assistance who may have health and social care needs. The PRG recommended that in circumstances when someone needing homelessness assistance has complex needs requiring input from multiple services, that a case coordination approach should be put into place. The group also made a series of recommendations relating to domestic abuse and homelessness, including that victims should have access to support and security measures to remain safely in their own home, where this is their preference. The second set of recommendations focus on changes to current Scottish homelessness legislation that could incentivize prevention. The proposal seeks to clarify, strengthen and extend a duty to prevent homelessness and integrate it within the main statutory framework to help resolve the current tension between local authority statutory homelessness duties and non-statutory prevention activity. Specific proposals include extending the duty on local authorities to assist anyone threatened with homelessness within the next six months, rather than the current 56 days. The group recommended prescription of a range of reasonable steps to be used to prevent or alleviate homelessness based on the existing housing options framework to be included in a personalized and tailored housing plan that maximizes applicants' choice and control. Minimum provision would include housing options information, advice and advocacy, support for landlords and tenants in the private rented sector, welfare and debt advice and assistance, support for those experiencing domestic abuse, family mediation and support of furniture and some other goods. Departing from the position in Wales and England following the introduction of the Housing Wales Act and Homelessness Reduction Act, the group did not recommend that local authorities can discharge the rehousing duty if individuals fail to cooperate with these reasonable steps. It's hard to, over to overstate how big a difference these changes could make. They represent a radical expansion and reshaping of the legal duties owed to homeless or at risk, or at -risk households, which go further than preceding reforms in England and Wales in particular in requiring cooperation from other public bodies. And perhaps most relevant to the theme of today's conference, the group also recommend that we expand the range of housing options into which local authorities can discharge their prevention and rehousing duties in a set of proposals described as maximal housing options approach. The underlying principles are to maximise choice and security of tenure wherever possible, while recognising that for some households, such as those who want and need supported housing, security of tenure may not be the most important factor influencing their housing choice. Recognising that a maximal housing options approach needs to balance stability, suitability and applicant choice. This is why there would be safeguards in place to ensure the accommodation someone would be rehoused in would always be stable and suitable to their needs. The proposed definition of stability is that the accommodation in question is available for a minimum of 12 months, the suitability assessed in relation to affordability, the best interests of any children within that household, location and access to services like employment, caring responsibilities and education, needs relating to health and where abuse is a factor, proximity to the perpetrator. As is currently the case, Social and private tenancies and owner occupation that meet these checks would be standard discharge options. But discharge into a range of non-standard options will be possible, subject to additional safeguards, including explicit written consent from the applicant. Later on today, our colleagues will be launching the Shared Spaces research and a paper setting out the policy direction for supported housing as a response to homelessness in Scotland. This provides vision for how supported accommodation can play a role as a settled housing option for a small number of people who find themselves homeless, who don't want and or can't sustain a mainstream tenancy, including with housing first support. The outcomes of this research offer the chance to take us closer to imagining a system where housing, homelessness and health and social care departments plan and deliver services together. As the policy paper being published today says, the overall goal is to break down silos and provision and provide a high quality supported housing environment 
with sustainable funding models commissioned through joint planning to enable settled lives destigmatized from the current temporary homeless accommodation system. Supported housing as a settled housing option is just one example of the housing options that could play a greater role in the settled housing options available to homeless households in the future. Now, these changes will very clearly be quite complex and it will take time and energy to make sure that we get them right. But if enacted, they could help us in Scotland to build a truly leading system of prevention. And the good news is that our call for new prevention measures has a wide political support with every party in the Scottish Parliament supporters, supportive of calls to strengthen the law and introduce new duties to prevent homelessness. In fact, last month, so the publication of the Scottish Government's Programme for Government, setting out the First Minister's plans for the coming year and beyond within this parliamentary term, and a crisis we were delighted to see that explicitly outlined a commitment to these changes. The Programme for Government committed to strengthen the law around homelessness prevention, as well as to launch a consultation on new prevention duties, which is due to launch by the end of this year. At Crisis, we strongly welcome these plans, which we definitely believe hold the potential to make Scotland a world leader in ending homelessness. We hope there will be engagement with this consultation, not only across the housing and homelessness sector, but also from stakeholders in health and social care, criminal justice, children and young people services and beyond, so that we can make this legislation the best that it can be and to take us one step closer to delivering the ambition outlined in the um, outlined by the Christie Commission. This is a critical moment for homelessness in Scotland. We know that everyone should have a safe, settled place to live. We know that too many people are forced to experience the indignity and also trauma of homelessness. And we also know, as we've seen over the past year, that with the right political will, and when we all work together, we can make huge strides in ending it. We cannot allow the action taken during the pandemic to represent a high watermark in Scotland's attempts to end homelessness. None of us want to meet up over the years to come and, and look back on what could have been. Instead, we must push on, keeping up momentum and making sure that we build on the action taken during the pandemic to protect those experiencing homelessness of any kind, while working to turn up the system so that more and more people are not forced out of their homes. The best way to end homelessness is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And by working together, we can do just that. <laughs>